when evil rises. Good men become outlaws, cyber chillos. I bet that right now, you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Let me tell you why you're here, cyber outlaws. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the fairy tale narrative espoused by celebrity switch influencers. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to the Outlaw YouTube channel. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Prison Matrix? Do you want to know what a Prison Matrix is? The Prison Matrix is everywhere, I say. It is all around you. It's everywhere. Even now, on this social media platform, you can see it when you watch a Prison Smith Tube channel, or when you turn on your television and watch History Channel's Pangolent or American Me Homies. You can read it in some fake news fabricated prison pang indictment. When you go cruising with your lady. When. You pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you outlaws from the truth. That you have been brainwashed. Cyber outlaws. Like everyone else you were born into mental bondage. Into a prison matrix. That you cannot taste or see or touch. Full of colorful switch influencers who subconsciously glamorize gangsterism, and going to prison. A prison matrix for your mind. The prison matrix is a system, homies. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around. What do you see? Naive youngsters, Chicano sellout conformist, celebrity switch influencer fanboys. The very minds of the people that need to be saved. But until we do outlaws, these people are still part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand cyber. Outlaws, most of these people aren't ready to be unplugged from the prison matrix. And many of them are so indoctrinated, so hopelessly dependent on the celebrity switch influencers propaganda, that they will fight to protect it and their celebrity switch influencers. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the prison matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. Warning this is your last chance homies. After this there is no turning back. You can continue listening to celebrity switch influencers, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever fairy tale you have been indoctrinated to believe. If you keep watching The Outlaw, you stay in Wonderland, and you see how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember Outlaws, all that soccer is the truth, nothing more. There's no link to a PayPal, or monthly member fees. Cyber Outlaws, let us get started. Welcome Cyber Posse to the Outlaw News, the social media cholo journalist, the voice of the barrio, the voice of the pato loco. Cyber Posse, while you get suited and needed for our main topic, the Outlaw presents a new segment to the show's format, called This poem is the preface to Luis Bato Talamantes's collection of prison poems, which were published as a book titled, Life Within the Heart Imprisoned, The Collected Poems of Luis Talamantes, in 1976. The preface poem is written by Antonio Cordova, and is titled, Talamantes, Talamantes. After Luis Bato Talamantes, the poem begins with, Talamantes, Talamantes. Are you there? Yes. You dirty bastards, I'm still here. And the fading footsteps echo through the hollow shell a cold and empty cell. Talamantes. Talamantes. We will break you soon or late, the body is easily broken, but the spirit is too great. And the days slip in, and out of that dark, and barren shell a cold and empty cell. Talamantes. Talamantes. In darkness, what do you see? Guns, with which you hold Aslan, and jails you keep us in, but though we're wrapped in chains the jailer is not free. And the hollow ring of steel on steel echoes through that barren shell a cold and empty cell. Talamantes. Talamantes. Your lost youth will never be regained. True, the hair grows white, but in the process I have learned the way you think, I have learned your language, your politics, your strengths and your weaknesses. I have learned the enemy. 
in keeping me here, what have you gained? And the years creep in and out of that dark, repressive shell a cold and empty cell. Talamantes. Talamantes. Free, you shall never be. When the eagle finds the serpent, we shall see. And a nervous laughter echoed through that hollow shell a cold and empty cell. Talamantes. Talamantes. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? And the words re-echoed through that dark, forbidding shell a cold and empty cell. Written for Luis Talamantes, by New Mexico activist leader Antonio Cordova, prior to his death in 1972, by state police ambush. On January 1972, Rito Canals and Antonio Cordova, members of the New Mexico Chicano Civil Rights, youth organization known as the Black Berets, were killed in a barrage of gunfire by the Albuquerque Police Department and New Mexico State Police's Cointel Pro Red Squad. Canals and Cordova's organization, the Black Berets brought attention to prison conditions in New Mexico, whose institutions were made up mostly of Chicano and Native American prisoners. On November 1971 the Black Berets organization, who believed in direct action against state oppression, attempted a citizen's arrest of New Mexico's state penitentiary's warden by the name of Felix Rodriguez prior to the ambush murder of Canals and Cordova. The Black Berets were going to hold a press conference to expose wrongdoings at the state prisons and the police terror inflicted through the local Metro Red Squad unit, who ran local state Cointel Pro operations against civil rights activist and prison reformist. Before this press conference happened, the police ambushed and murdered the author of this poem, Antonio Cordova and his homeboy Rito Canals. It was an assassination, pure and simple, said the Black Berets co-founder, Richard Moore, previously to news media. Moore's and fellow Chicano activists' suspicions were confirmed years later. When in 1996 a man named Tim Chapa testified in court that he Chapa acting as a one-time former APD informant provocateur, had helped set up the assassination of Rito Canals and Antonio Cordova. The early 70s were a culmination of a brutal crackdown against Chicano and Native American activist groups across the state of New Mexico and the rest of the country, a nationwide campaign of police violence, frame-ups, and assassinations, in the wake of the civil rights movement, known by its acronym COINTELPRO. In 1972 four of the most prominent grassroots Chicano movement, and prison reform activists from the Southwest, would be murdered under suspicious circumstances. Rito Canals and Antonio Cordova, on January of 72, Ricardo Falcon, who's murdered seven months later on August of 72, and California prison's biggest prison reformist next to George Jackson, Rudy Cheyenne, Kadena, who's murdered on December of 72. Cyber Posse welcome, to the Outlaw News, the voice of the Barrio, the voice of the Vado Loco. Today Cyber Outlaws, we do what celebrity snitch influencer, and Vacaville CIA, MK Ultra test subject Mundo Mendoza, been avoiding his entire celebrity snitch career. Discussing one Eddie, Edward Sailor Boy Gonzalez, not only Mundo Mendoza's crime partner, but also the first of the two serial killer snitch ex-mafiosos to publicly be named as a law enforcement informant provocateur in 1977. One year before Mundo was named publicly as an informant provocateur, and transformed into a celebrity snitch influencer. Sailor Boy Gonzalez also was a Mexican Mafia member longer than MK Ultra programmed serial killer Mundo. Sailor Boy Gonzalez joined the Mexican Mafia at DVI Tracy in the late 60s. Just as the Mexican Mafia was starting to form and recruit its first wave of members. So Sailor Boy's knowledge of the Mexican Mafia is more extensive apparently than MK Ultra programmed Mundo Mendoza. So that's why the outlaw wants you Cyber Cholos to listen to the only known public interview Eddie Sailor Boy Gonzalez ever gave. 
which also predates any interview Mundo Mendoza gave. Sailor Boy Gonzalez's interview not only contradicts most of what the public has been brainwashed to believe by Mundo Mendoza, boxer Enriquez, and other celebrity snitch influencers. Sailor Boy Gonzalez's interview was a very controversial topic during the trial of the suspected Mexican Mafia killers of Ellen Delia. So controversial, that your boys the outlaw want you cyber homeboys to listen to. This San Bernardino Sun newspaper article, from January 1979, covering the controversy over reporter John Hammerley's interview with Sailor Boy Gonzalez in 1977. Sacramento, AP, a state appeals court Tuesday upheld a jail sentence against a reporter who refused to turn over unpublished notes and tapes of an interview with a Mexican Mafia member. The 3rd District Court of Appeal, in a 3-0 decision, upheld a trial court ruling, which directed newsman John Hammerley, to turn over the materials to the defense in the Ellen Delia murder trial. Hammerley, at the time a Sacramento Union reporter, claimed the California Reporter Shield law protected him from turning over material from his interview with Mexican Mafia member Edward Gonzalez. Hammerley, who now works for the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, said after Tuesday's ruling, he hoped the state Supreme Court would reverse the decision. Before I was held in contempt, I decided to face whatever consequences would occur. Unfortunately, the worst has occurred today, Hammerley said. Hammerley's lawyer, Willem Shubb, said the appeals court ruling would not be effective for 30 days, to allow time for appeal to the Supreme Court. Both New West Magazine, and the Sacramento Union published an interview by Hammerley with a key prosecution witness in the murder trial of four men, accused of murdering Ellen Delia. She was killed near the Sacramento airport in 1977, while reportedly en route to tell state officials about alleged abuses of an East Los Angeles drug halfway house, operated by her estranged husband. The husband is one of the defendants. When lawyers for the defendants demanded to see Hammerley's notes, Superior Court Judge John Bosovich ordered Hammerley to produce them. When he refused, he sentenced him to jail for civil contempt for an unspecified term. The decision was concurred in by Justices Cruz Reynoso and Hugh Evans. On December 9, 1977 Sacramento Union reporter John Hammerley published the first known interview, with a Mexican Mafia member turned informant. Edward Sailor Boy Gonzalez, who was weeks away from testifying before a grand jury, about his participation in the prison spawn Mexican Mafia organization, and his role in the Ellen Delia murder, who was found shot dead, and left in a field near the Sacramento airport on February 17, 1977. Ellen Delia had just flown into Sacramento from Los Angeles shortly before she was murdered. She was in Sacramento to meet with state officials, to expose what she knew about illegal activities in her ex-husband's federally funded community-based drug program in East Los Angeles, named Get Going. Sailor Boy Gonzalez, was not just the first ex-Mexican mafia to give an exclusive interview to media. Sailor was also allegedly the highest-ranking known member of the Mexican mafia to flip, and start cooperating with law enforcement. Eddie Sailor Boy Gonzalez's account, and history of the formation of the Mexican Mafia, predate any other informant's version of Mexican Mafia history. Mundo officially never gave an interview, or detailed the rise of the Mexican Mafia till the 80s, televised interview with FBI's director Clarence Kelly. Sailor Boy's interview with John Hammerley, which appeared in New West Magazine on December 1977. During the period in which Mundo Mendoza was still undercover as an MK Ultra programmed snitch provocateur. So it's important cyber outlaws to pay attention to Sailor Boy's interview, which you'll listen to today. Sailor Boy's accounts of the rise of the Mexican Mafia differs from the one the public has been brainwashed to believe by celebrity snitch Mundo Mendoza. Now let's get suited and booted outlaw posse. The December 1977 New West Magazine interview of Edward Sailor Boy Gonzalez by reporter John Hammerley begins with On January 2, 1978, a man named Eddie Gonzalez, will be escorted into a heavily guarded Sacramento courtroom by bodyguards, from the U.S. Marshals Protective Custody Program. As his former colleagues watch from the defense table, Eddie, a shooter, 
who traded testimony for immunity and a new identity, will take the stand in the first major trial involving the so-called Mexican Mafia, a prison spawn gang, that turned from street fighting, to heroin running and contract murder. Eddie will be a key witness in the trial of four Mexican Mafia soldiers, who are accused of the much-publicized murder of Ellen Delia, a woman whose talent for writing proposals for federal grants, won funding for the Get Going Project of East Los Angeles, a social welfare program, that may have been used by the Mexican Mafia, as a front for dealing in heroin and cocaine. Delia's body was found outside the Sacramento airport, on February 17, 1977, and it was Eddie Gonzalez's grand jury testimony that helped indict four members of the Mexican Mafia for the murder. Only the secret grand jury testimony of Eddie Gonzalez enabled law enforcement authorities to penetrate the veil of mystery that surrounds the notorious Mexican Mafia. And thanks to Eddie Gonzalez, we can tell the inside story of the Mexican Mafia for the first time. What the jury is likely to hear according to Eddie's version of the story, a scenario of betrayal and brutality leading to the execution of Ellen Delia by her lover Alfredo Alfie Sosa, with the help of her estranged husband, Michael Delia. The Mexican Mafia believed that Ellen, who served as executive secretary of Get Going, was ready to inform authorities about the misuse of the project's federal funds. Alfie Sosa told Eddie Gonzalez that Ellen must be murdered. Eddie checked with Michael to confirm that the proposed hit was strictly business. Not a personal grudge by Alfie against his girlfriend. And then the hit was on. Alfie lured Ellen to Sacramento with the promise that they would patch up their troubled love affair and at the same time share some good cocaine. Ellen was driven to the Los Angeles airport by Michael Delia. She was met at the Sacramento airport by Eddie Gonzalez and Alfie Sosa, who had enlisted the services of the two other defendants, Abraham and Juan Hernandez, in spotting a deserted site near the airport, where Ellen could be killed and dumped. Eddie and Alfie developed an elaborate ruse to avoid arousing Ellen's suspicions. As soon as they picked her up at the airport, Alfie began to cough intermittently, a common habit among veteran cocaine users. The cough grew worse as they left the airport and drove along the empty road. When they reached the murder site, the hacking and coughing were unbearable. Alfie signaled Eddie to pull over to the side of the road, where he left the car and bent over a roadside ditch, as if he were vomiting you'd better help your boyfriend. Eddie suggested, before the cops spot us and start hassling us. Ellen slipped out of the rental car and joined her boyfriend at the side of the road. When she leaned over his shoulder to help him, Alfie grabbed Ellen and jammed the barrel of his gun under her right ear, near the back of her skull. And then he pulled the trigger. Alfie returned to the car and Eddie pulled away. Ellen Delia's body was found later that night by a farmer. She had been silenced. After I had written a number of newspaper stories about the escapades of the Mexican Mafia, I received a telephone call from Eddie Gonzalez. For the past dozen years he told me, he had been among a select group of shooters, who ran the gang's murder and drug operations after being arrested on a firearms charge. Eddie agreed to turn state's evidence in exchange for a new life for himself and his family. Now he wanted to tell his story, after a few more conversations. I found myself on an airplane for a distant city, which will remain unidentified and a date with a self-admitted murderer turned informant during several days of conversation at different rendezvous points. He detailed the origins and growth of the Mexican Mafia, the contract and disciplinary murders that he had carried out as a shooter and the gang's use of federal funds to purchase heroin and cocaine. As far as we can verify it, Eddie's story is true. His revelations about the inner workings of the Mexican Mafia have been analyzed by corrections officials, Department of Justice authorities, undercover agents, from the Los Angeles Police Department, and several Sacramento law enforcement specialist state officials agree, that Eddie, is the highest ranking Mexican Mafia member to turn state's evidence. His grand jury testimony, as an unindicted co-conspirator, in the Alan Delia murder case, was crucial to the indictment of the four defendants. For the first time, Eddie is talking about the Mexican Mafia outside the locked doors of a grand jury chamber. We don't know Eddie's new name, but he was known as Sailor, 
when he spent his nights rolling them outside Long Beach bars, as a teenager. At 18, the California Youth Authority caught up with Eddie, and sent him to the dual vocational institution in Tracy, where he was reunited with many of the young men he knew and ran within several East Los Angeles gangs. Eddie arrived at Duel to witness the birth of the Mexican Mafia. When I got there, the guys ran down to me, what the Mafia was doing. Eddie recalls. It was a kid's trip then, just a branch of our street gangs in East Los Angeles. A slap on the back, a carton of cigarettes, and lots of talk. So I said, sure, why not? But even in its embryonic stages, the Mexican Mafia was more than talk. In a correctional facility later dubbed the Gladiator School for its history of gang-related killings, membership in the feared and respected Mexican Mafia was a way to survive. We pressured people. Eddie says. They got killed, of course. If I felt like killing somebody, I would. If I didn't, I wouldn't. We were having fun then. When Eddie was released from Duel, he found that his Mexican Mafia connection extended to the streets of East Los Angeles, where Eddie and his fellow gang members began running together and organizing small-scale robberies. The Mexican Mafia named in conscious imitation of their Italian namesake, began to earn the respect of rival street gangs. It may not be the kind of respect that most people want. Eddie explains, but it's more respect than you ever got before. Before, you don't have nothing, you don't have any hopes of having anything and the Mafia offers something. Financially, it offers a lot, and even friendship and statue too. Still, the Mexican Mafia was no more than an East Los Angeles gang, until the idea began to spread to California's adult prisons. It went to San Quentin, Eddie says, where it woke up people who make a career out of crime, who have dedicated their whole lives to breaking the law. And they said, look man, you're doing this for nothing. Let's do it for something, under the guidance of prison-hardened leaders including Joe Pegleg Morgan, an inmate who has spent 30 of his 47 years behind bars, the gang was transformed from an informal alliance of street fighters, into a cohesive criminal organization that reached into barrios and prisons throughout the state, it was Joe Morgan, who directed the diversification of the Mexican Mafia, scoring its first kilo of Mexican heroin, and funneling contract money from organized crime on the East Coast, for hits on the West Coast. By mid-1975, the Mexican Mafia was running a half dozen kilos of pure Mexican heroin from Tijuana and Juarez to drops in East Los Angeles, San Francisco, Sacramento and Fresno, a $60,000 a week wholesale trade, that would be worth millions when the heroin was cut and peddled on the streets. And the Department of Justice's estimates, that the Mexican Mafia is responsible for more than 100 contract murders during the past few years. Eddie was swept along with the sudden growth of the Mexican Mafia. They were like a baby. Stumbling, and learning how to walk, Eddie recalls. It wasn't until 1975, when they flexed their muscles, and people started dying, that they started making a lot of money. It was really scary how fast it happened. In 75, there were 35 Mexican Mafia dudes running around, and all we could afford was an S80 jalopy. Within three months, I was driving a new car. Eddie's specialty in the Mexican Mafia was murder. His last contract was worth $20,000, he received a three-paragraph description of the victim's daily habits, spent a day watching him, and then shot him at point-blank range, while the victim was warming up his car in the garage. He didn't look like a bad guy, Eddie shrugs, but somebody didn't like him $20,000 worth. My conscience? It doesn't bother a bit. To be truthful, I felt a little bigger and stronger in fact, the Mexican Mafia places a special value on its shooters. The people who kill in the Mexican Mafia are supposed to be the most sincere, Eddie explains. The shooters are always the ones in line for the top jobs. And their idea of a big shot was being a killer. I guess I looked for people to idolize me in fear. I figured if people were scared of me, they respected me. Wielding a gun for the Mexican Mafia was a sign of loyalty and commitment, that could save a gang member's life. The books are open, once you're let in, it's a lifelong thing. Eddie says. 
The first thing you have to do when you're in is get the first big contract. Those who tried to avoid the murder detail were often victims of it. Eddie recalls the fate of a gang member named Elmo, who was assigned to carry out disciplinary beatings and vengeance murders against rival gangs inside the walls of Folsom Prison. When he balked, those walls were no protection against his comrades on the outside. Elmo was in the Mexican Mafia for four or five years, and he hadn't even stabbed one person, Eddie says in disgust. He was always bitching about being sick, or having a headache. He was like an old bitch, who doesn't want to go to bed with her husband. They gave him a final warning. Then they killed him. The Mexican Mafia, according to Eddie Gonzalez, includes about 150 full-fledged members, but another 700, or 800 hanger-ons, and prospective members extend its influence throughout California. Officials already report Mafia rumblings in prisons in Arizona, Utah and New Mexico. And the same officials agree with Eddie's estimate, that the drug and murder activities of the Mexican Mafia in California, amount to a 10 million a year operation. The Mexican Mafia's main man in cocaine and heroin dealing, Eddie says is Robert Robot Salas, a longtime confidant of Joe Morgan. Robot, working through fellow Mexican Mafia members hiding from the law in Mexico, would arrange shipments of drugs and then dole out the kilos and pounds to various Mafia connections around the state. It was strictly on a need basis, Eddie says. East LA alone would go through four or five kilos a week. Morgan, who is now in jail after an arrest on a federal firearms charge, is said to be so strung out on heroin, that he is unable to direct the daily operations of the Mexican Mafia. Although Eddie says that it probably took Mafia members all of 5 or 10 minutes to raise Morgan's $35,000 bail, a corrections department source claims that Morgan has surrounded himself with young women, and is of no use to the Mexican Mafia, except to provide a titular role. Eddie says, that Morgan has passed the bag, or transferred the reins of power to Robot Salas. But Salas too, is facing murder charges in Fresno though he reportedly managed to get out of jail long enough to pass the bag to yet another longtime Mafia soldier. According to Eddie, the Mexican Mafia bag is filling up with new sources of revenue, and expansion into safer yet profitable enterprises, that was launched by Michael Delia, Pimples. Delia, suggested that the Mexican Mafia establish a self-help group, to qualify for some of the millions of federal dollars in federal grants that were available in social welfare programs, Mike wanted to get these funds real bad. Eddie says. He used to say. Hey look. Here is this money for the taking. What are we waiting for? Not so coincidentally. Delia's estranged wife Ellen, had been writing grant programs for years. She wrote the grant requests, and shortly after the first proposal was submitted, Delia's Get Going project and its Mexican Mafia members found themselves $250,000 richer. One of the most feared killers in the Mafia Alfredo Alfie Sosa, was introduced to Ellen, also known as Ellie, and initiated an intimate relationship with her. At the time, Delia introduced them, because Sosa, wanted to get in on the Get Going project's action. And it worked. Alfie got on the board of directors, and was involved in most all of the important votes on what to do with the money. Eddie continues. Mike and Alfie, slowly brought all the people they wanted from the Mafia into get going. Soon, it was all Mafia. With working capital from the federal government in hand, Delia knew what he now needed was political support, Eddie says. Where to go and who to approach was the problem. The solution's name was Robert Lewis. State Senator Alex Garcia's former top man in Southern California. He had been operating his construction business on shaky financial grounds, Eddie says. He needed money, and somehow Delia found out about Lewis's plight. He had his hand out from the beginning, and a few other people approached him and told him they would clean up his debts if he would front the Mafia to the Senator for them. So he talked to the Senator. But he held out his hand one too many times, and they found they didn't need him. They were already secure with the senator. Shortly after that assessment of the situation was made, Lewis was murdered the senator wasn't illegal, Eddie comments. He was doing his job. 
But he was so impressed with Mike and these people he met through Lewis, that he really believed everything that was said. After he met Mike and read just the paper figures about the success rate, he just felt this was really something. The Mafia members within Get Going made sure that the people being treated in the program, including many recently released Mafia inmates, whom Get Going vouched for, would have clean urinalysis samples in tests for drug addiction, Eddie says. No one would have dirty samples. They Get Going supervisors would pee in the bottles for them. You're going to see a lot of officials wearing sunglasses and ducking interviews, because of the things with Get Going, he continues. I bet there's going to be a lot of embarrassment. Eddie categorically says, Get Going had developed a very effective form of subtly pressuring for corrections and parole authorities, to release inmates, into the project's welcoming arms. Get Going, had one of the best success records of all the other programs around, because some records were doctored. Ellen Delia was murdered before she could reveal what she knew about the Mexican Mafia's penetration into federal grantsmanship, and the politics of community organizing. But, her death prompted a flurry of state, and federal interest in Get Going, and another inmate self-help program. Community Concern Both programs have been shut down by authorities, putting an end to the yearly flow of one million in federal funds into the hands of Mexican Mafia members and their associates. Only a few months ago, Eddie Gonzalez was earning up to $20,000 for a single contract murder. Today, he lives somewhere outside California. It's all part of the deal, a new identity, a new home for himself and his family, a small allowance. But Eddie is attending classes at a local trade school, in the hope of supplementing his income. I don't know where all the money goes, Eddie says, with a shrug. At this moment, Eddie might be poring over the trade school manuals, or helping his wife with the kids, or watching a football game on television. Eddie outguessed the point spreads given in the local newspapers. But he knows that the quiet rhythm of his new life might be interrupted at any moment, by the inevitable telephone call, from the officials who gave him safety. In exchange for testimony the phone call will summon him to the local airport for the flight to Sacramento and the courtroom rendezvous which will bring Eddie Gonzalez, face to face with his former comrades of the Mexican Mafia. There it is Cyber Outlaws, Eddie Sailor Boy Gonzalez's only known interview, again from reporter John Hammerley, which was published in New West Magazine, December 1977. Let's get right into it Cyber Outlaws. Not only was Sailor Boy's interview controversial, because the defense in the Ellen Delia murder trial, believed Sailor Boy's interview notes contained proof Sailor was an active informant while participating in several murders but, so too was the controversial arrest of Ellen Delia's killers. By the illegal arrest of Mexican Mafia members Alfie Sosa, and Mundi Varela, whose confession was illegally attained. If you didn't know any better, it seemed as if the Special Prison Gang Task Force had prior knowledge in advance Ellen Delia would be killed, and waited for the killers to conveniently come back to Southern California to be arrested. Before we go further Cyber Cholos, allow the outlaw to point out something very few individuals know. Prior to Ellen Delia's marriage to Mexican Mafia member Mike Delia, and taking a sudden interest in the Chicano and prison reform movement, Ellen was previously married and has a daughter, her previous last name was Weatherford. And Ellen's first husband was apparently working for the CIA. And it won't be the last time the CIA and Mexican Mafia in the same sentence will happen here on the Outlaw News. Now back to Sailor Boy Gonzalez's interview, right off this interview was something approved by, and at the request of Sailor Boy's informant provocateur handlers. An informant cannot just give an interview unless arranged by law enforcement, who often use their deputized reporter friends like Chris Blatchford. So basically this interview is some over-glorified partially true story. Now it's very interesting cyber outlaws, but not surprising, that Sailor Boy made no mention of Rudy Cadena in his interview, considering celebrity snitch influencers and gang experts claim Rudy Cadena was the first Mexican mafia to organize criminal activities and infiltrate community organizations on the streets. Yet, 
besides vague allegations and subconscious attempts to tarnish and criminalize Kadena's character. There's no real proof Kadena was into any illegal activities. And Eddie Sailor Boy Gonzalez's interview confirms that Kadena was in fact a genuine Chicano revolutionary, and not linked to any illegal activities. In fact Sailor Boy Gonzalez asserted that originally the Mexican Mafia was a unorganized loose alliance of predominantly Los Angeles area teens. Until Morgan restructured the Mexican Mafia into a more organized criminal group, who didn't flex its muscle till 1975. Long after Kadena was dead. Also cyber outlaws, sailor boy plus celebrity snitches, and gang experts repeatedly tell of known fugitive Mexican Mafia members openly hiding out in border towns along the Mexican border. Yet left alone to smuggle large amounts of drugs to the United States, and live a luxurious life never hiding their fugitive Mexican Mafia status or fearing arrest. Does that make sense cyber outlaws, or some red flag suspect shit? Cyber homies Sailor Boy stated the Mexican Mafia began large-scale illegal operations starting in 1975 after Morgan, Mundo, and Sailor Boy Gonzalez, organized the Mexican Mafia outside of prison, establishing the first known documented alleged Mexican Mafia drug operation, which has never been proven in court. The alleged stories of early Mexican Mafia illegal activities making large sums of illegal money, and moving serious weight allegedly running a multi-million dollar drug operation. Yet, none of the cases involving the Mexican Mafia during the period Sailor Boy Gonzalez refers to 1975 to 1980. Are drug-related cases or proven the existence of a drug operation making $60,000 a week? All the Mexican Mafia criminal cases from 1975 to 1980 are murders, or robbery, none of the celebrity snitch informants like Mundo or Sailor Boy ever led law enforcement to any secret illegal stash of money, or was it proven in court by their testimony in a drug smuggling case? Similar to today, with celebrity snitch influencers Rene Boxer Enriquez. Well, my concept of the organization was skewed. I thought it was silk suits, limousines, hot chicks, all the money in the world. It was none of that when I got in the organization. And the Northern Boxer, John Mendoza, who both tell braggadocios glorified fairy tales of knowledge of secret illegal bank accounts by their respected ex-criminal organizations. Claiming to have in-depth info of illegal bank accounts, or to personally sending several thousands every month to alleged Pelican Bay gang leaders as Boxer Mendoza asserts to his book club fanboys, and viewers. Yet, Mysteriously these two individuals Boxer Enriquez and Boxer Mendoza both have never led their law enforcement handlers to confiscate any illegal bank accounts, or testified in court to the existence of any illegal funds hidden in shoe prisoners' bank accounts, or any murders that both proclaimed some Pelican Bay alleged gang leaders committed or ordered. Instead they're only put on the stand to testify as gang experts, never as confidential informants with first-hand knowledge of crimes only second-hand hypothetical opinions, against people they never met. Don't believe the outlaw, cyber cholos conduct your own investigation. You'll find these two individuals' testimony only as gang experts giving their hypothetical opinions. Quickly let's touch the subject of Elmo Duran's murder. Who sailor boy claimed the killing was for not carrying out hits against rivals like the Nuestra Familia. Cyber homies, Elmo Duran was part of Rudy Cadena's faction. The revolutionary Mexican Mafia members, who even after Cadena's death by the Nuestra Familia, an incident heavily instigated by Joe Morgan and Mundo Mendoza, still was pushing for peace between Mexican Mafia and Nuestra Familia. In an affidavit by Robert Hyde a prison member, and founder of the California prison created Symbionese Liberation Army. The California prison gang, you're not supposed to know about. Hyde claims and provided private investigators, a prison kite apparently a hit list of prisoners marked for assassination by fellow snitch prisoners, on orders by prison guards. The hit list kite possessed both Rudy Cadena's, and Elmo Duran's names, as targeted individuals for assassination. Before the outlaw forgets, Mike Delia's Get Going program never faced criminal charges for fraud, it simply lost its government funding. Also losing its funding was Ralph Chispa's Sandoval's community concern. A legitimate organization, 
that was never proven to have committed any wrongdoings by the group, or its leader revolutionary prison activist, Ralph Chispas Sandoval. There's a interesting unknown fact about Mike Delia's Get Going to Cyber Outlaws. Get Going, was established, with help from East Coast mafiosos living on the West Coast. The Italian mafiosos taught Delia, a alleged Mexican mafia member who's also Italian and the son of an Italian mafioso, to skim money out of his government-funded organization. Had the government pursued criminal charges against Get Going it's possible the East Coast mafiosos living in California, would have also possibly been charged in connection with the defrauding of government-funded Get Going. Or at least publicly named as having connections to the Get Going scandal. Specifically one mafioso, Jimmy the Weasel Fraciano, who was closely working allegedly with several Mexican Mafia members in Los Angeles. Who was an undercover informant provocateur, helping Chicano gangsters on the West Coast to defraud a government-funded program, or hiring as hitmen. Cyber Outlaws, before we end this spill, your boys the Outlaws saved the last controversial topic from Eddie Edward Sailor Boy Gonzalez's interview with John Hammerley. Sailor Boys claims that Joe Morgan was in no position of power within the Mexican Mafia because he was too strung out on heroin, even law enforcement claim Joe Morgan was not capable of running day-to-day -day operations within the Mexican Mafia because Morgan was strung out on drugs and surrounded himself with young females who were also using heroin. Now, the outlaw knows it's hard to comprehend what Sailor Boy Gonzalez claims about the man celebrity snitch influencers, law enforcement, and deputized media have indoctrinated us the public to believe is some demigod prison gangster, Joe Morgan, that Morgan is no longer in charge of the Mexican Mafia. Well cyber outlaws besides rumors and snitch gossip. There is no real documentation of Joe Morgan maintaining any leadership role within the Mexican Mafia after Morgan's 1981 conviction for the Robert Marozic murder. Besides some rumors of Morgan supposedly ordering the killings of the three movie advisors on the American Me, Edward James Olmos movie or extorting Olmos. Truth be told, the only extorting of Olmos was a lawsuit filed against Edward James Olmos by Jody, Joe Morgan's wife, which was dismissed. Also the charge of extorting Olmos was conveniently dropped from the 1996 Mexican Mafia Rico case, because it was really informant provocateur Ernesto Chuco Castro, who was heard on the Mexican Mafia surveillance tapes pushing the idea and issue of extorting or assaulting Edward James Olmos. Or the fact that prosecutors working the three technical advisors from American Me murder trial never presented the motives for any of the three advisors killers, as resulting from their connection to the American Me movie. Basically there's no real known documentation of Joe Morgan actively involved or maintaining some godfather figure role. Even Joe Morgan's death was just seen as another old time con dying. Except for celebrity snitch influencers, and law enforcement who seem to be the only individuals who sensationalize Joe Morgan's life and death for some strange reason. Finally these allegations of Morgan surrounding himself with young females, who are fellow heroin addicts. One specific young female companion of Joe Morgan, Maria Crystal Alonzo, who happened to be one of the remaining members of Charlie Manson's hippie gang-like cult, the Manson Family, who in the late 60s killed actress Sharon Tate, and several other well-known, or wealthy individuals, in order to start a race war against African Americans, who then in the early 70s decided she loves blacks, specifically black prison revolutionaries like Patty Hearst who attempted to smuggle weapons into a California prison to her prison revolutionary lovers, receiving only a slap on the hand sentence, only to be released from her sentence to hook up with and marry, a alleged Aryan Brotherhood member Billy Gauker, who both along with another alleged A.B. and several Manson family hippie sluts murdered two drug companions of theirs, except Maria Crystal Alonso, conveniently escaped being charged in the murders so she could then help two other federal prisoners, claiming bogus revolutionary status, to plot an attempt kidnapping of a foreign government figure, to ransom the release of the two fake prisoner revolutionaries, and also requested the release of Black Panther activist, Angela Davis. Even though as a Manson family member she tried to frame the Black Panthers for the murders, the Manson family committed. Get this, 
Cyber outlaws, the bitch gets a six-month sentence in prison for this kidnapping plot, even after all her past infractions and notorious membership in the Manson family. Who was one of the girls seen with a shaved head, and a fresh X carved onto her forehead crawling in front of the court trial of Manson? Somehow after all this drama, that is Maria Crystal Alonso's drug-fueled life. She's tired of the crazy hippie cult life, extreme racist convicts, fake prison radicals, hippie slut Alonso decided she wants to fuck with the bad boys of California prisons. The Southern California Chicano car, and begins to lay down with, and fuck Joe Morgan, as some side piece of booty, and becomes involved in Morgan's drug-related criminal endeavors. Joe Morgan again is represented by celebrity snitch influencers and gang experts as some super sharp intellectual prison gangster. Yet, can't see the obvious red flag that Maria Crystal Alonso is some informant provocateuring hippie slut. Or that the two individuals running his drug operation Mundo, and Sailor Boy are undercover snitches. This is why cyber outlaws, Mundo refuses to profile his buddy in provocateuring crimes, Eddie Sailor Boy Gonzalez, because he doesn't want anyone to find out that Eddie Sailor Boy Gonzalez, gave an interview before Mundo ever did. And how Sailor Boy's version of the rise of the Mexican Mafia, plus opinions on Joe Morgan's true influence, contradicts Mundo's, and current fairy tale telling gang experts, tell today. Stay suited and booted cyber outlaws, the struggle is real, and the lies are poisonous. Vence Remos, don't allow yourself to be indoctrinated.